Well, it's a new day here at ASEE's annual meeting and ASEE's TV is here in Baltimore to make sure that you don't miss a thing. Today we're diving into two major paths that engineering students can take after graduation, industry and academia. Hi, I'm Melissa Kim, host of ASWE TV. Engineers entering the workforce from all across the field may be wondering what that next step will look like. At a meeting like ASWE, folks come together from many realms, giving attendees the chance to see a wealth of options in industry and academia. Today, we're exploring what those options look like in practice. We'll get an overview of ASWE's division journals from Nancy Studi, editor of the Engineering Design Graphics Journal. Tertia A. Pinder Grover will share advice on leveraging your agency to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion across the engineering education ecosystem. Then Joyce Main and Holly Matasovich will explain the review process for two journals, JEE and AEE. And we'll continue our tour of innovations in engineering education with Cal State LA and straight from the exhibit hall, a collaborative effort from SF Microelectronics, Labsland, and DigiKey. But before all that, let's sit down with Doug Tuga, incoming president of ASWE. We're joined now by incoming president Doug Tuga. Doug, thanks so much for taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I know you have a busy, busy schedule, but um, tell me about your career up until this point. What led you to becoming the incoming president? Well, I've been at Valparaiso University for the past 27 years. I, I was the, an assistant professor, then department chair of electrical and computer engineering for 15 years, and now I'm the dean of engineering at Valpo. But during that same time, I've also been working my way through ASWE. I've, I've had leadership positions both in the section and in the zone, and then I, I went through the, the, the list of officers for two different divisions, then became the vice president of finance for four years, and now I'm the president-elect. So for people that come here, you know, future attendees, what can they expect to see in the next couple of years? You know, I, I think that every year the conference seems to be growing. I think uh, this year we have the, the most, most papers we've ever had. I think it's great to have a vibrant set of papers that no matter what your interest in engineering education is, there's going to be a paper here that you're really, really excited to see. I think we also have a, a growing exhibition hall. Uh, we have 102 exhibitors this year, and it's really exciting to see the, the number of, of people who are coming here because they want to show us uh, solutions to help us to teach our classes better. And how's AC going to work to strengthen its relationship with a lot of these outside organizations? Yeah, so so those relationships with those vendors is one of those ways. I think that uh, having more than a hundred companies come here to talk to our talk to our members and try to show them ways that they can teach their classes better is one. I also think though that there are a lot of other organizations that share our passion for engineering education. Uh, organizations like ABET and NCEES. These are really great partnerships that we've established uh, over, the, over the years. And then I think that there are lots of other new organizations that, that we're looking to build these relationships, both, both on the educational side, NSBE and SHIP, for example. And then also I would say uh, looking to, to build connections with corporations, so corporate members, uh, where we would, you know, companies like Boeing or ANSYS that are our corporate partners for us. I think this really provides a great opportunity for our members to learn more about those companies as well. And how do you hope that the members will benefit from all this? Well, one direct way that they're benefiting this year is we have a, we have a job fair for the first time. So especially graduate students uh, can come to, to come to the conference and have an opportunity to meet those employers and learn more about the opportunities that are available at those companies. And we actually talked to a lot of them yesterday, so that's a great point. Oh, wonderful. And wonderful. Um, you know, what is your best advice for those early career engineers? Oh, uh, my best advice is just get involved at ASWE. Go to conferences for all of the divisions you're interested in, learn more about those divisions, and go to their business meetings. Because the business meetings are where you get to meet the leaders of that division. You'll get to learn more about how the division operates. Maybe you'll even get to take on a leadership role. Maybe someday you'll get to be ASWE president. Perfect. Doug Tugod, incoming president of ASWE, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us oh, today. It's, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. At Cal State LA, discover the groundbreaking EcoSTEM paradigm. This approach is revolutionizing engineering education by embracing an asset-based model that addresses the needs of an increasingly diverse student population in STEM. Who benefits from EcoSTEM? I would argue that everyone benefits from EcoSTEM. Not only all students are going to benefit, also the faculty and the staff 
but really the employers that hire our students are gonna benefit because we're having students who can bring their whole selves into the classroom and take their whole selves out into the workforce. We have three branches in the EcoSTEM project. The first one is Eco Communities, which focuses on providing faculty and administrator time and space to have difficult conversations on equity, diversity, and inclusion in education. The second uh, branch is EcoChange, which focuses on developing new tools to evaluate faculty. And the third uh, branch is the Eco Research, which is looking into ways to evaluate how well the system is doing and the health of the ecosystem. It's about taking everybody, the faculty, the students, the staff, what are their ideas? How do we support them to be successful? How do we create synergies to help everyone grow and thrive? We're joined now by Nancy Studi. Thanks so much for joining us today. And what role do the AC Division journals play? What's the impact of them? Well, they give the divisions a specific place to showcase the work that's being done by faculty and researchers in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And it gives the faculty, especially new faculty, a yeah. place to look for, you know, how do I teach this class? What have other people done? What results are they getting from that? So it keeps you from looking far and wide, just gives them a concentrated place to look. So. And there's obviously a bunch of different topics yep. that they cover. Um, how is that helpful? Well, there are good practices in education. And then there are specific good practices in engineering education. But what I might do in one of my engineering graphics or mechanical engineering technology courses, statics, dynamics, and so on, the way that that is taught is going to be different than the way something is taught in chemical engineering or electrical engineering. And so that way, it ha again, it goes back to helping people focus and concentrate on a specific area of what they teach. And why is that specifically important for an engineering scholarship? If I want to do, you know, if I want to build on my research area, you know, I'm looking at this as a faculty member, not an editor, because I am a, a journal editor. But if I'm teaching a new class or I want to improve what I'm doing in my class, it lets me see what other faculty are doing, what has been successful. And sometimes it's just as helpful to see what hasn't been successful. It's helped me improve my my experience in the classroom and also improve the experience that my students can have in the classroom. What is the key to being published in a division journal? Well, actually, um, we, we have a booth here at the conference and that was the most often asked question I had last night when I was staffing the booth. And a lot of them were new faculty say, how do I get published? And so what I recommend, especially for the division journals, is that they go to the journal's website, read the list of topics that are appropriate to that journal, um, read through the editorial process and how that, because they're a little bit different with the different journals. And then I think most importantly, read articles that have been previously published so you can see the tone they take, the topics they address, and how they approach um, you know, the articles in any particular journal. Really good, important information there, Nancy. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. In the era of remote learning options, hardware education has remained difficult to perform without access to the right tools. But a partnership between SF Microelectronics, Labsland, and DigiKey is bringing hardware education across the globe with its new online hardware learning service. Underprivileged communities historically have difficulty in getting access to tools that may cost a lot of money. And so the ability for them to access professional grade educational tools is paramount in the ability to build future engineers, future thinkers and innovators for America. We see that in many other fields, like there has been a process of also democratization of, of uh, the education. People can share uh, computer science courses and business courses, language courses, because they are all digital. Whereas in the ECE field, in engineering education, the problem is that the hardware is not digital. The goal of this partnership is basically to get hardware, to get everything from FPGAs to microcontrollers to uh, electronic labs available to people around the world in an affordable manner. 
with uh, our technology, like uh, universities can use that equipment uh, remotely, uh, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Professors can start teaching very fast uh, because they can, without all the logistics of buying all the kits for their students in the classroom, they can actually already use laboratories which are located uh, somewhere else in our network. I believe if the students learn on professional tools, then they have better tools themselves to enter the workforce. Everything we do is based on the STM32, which is the access. Then we have the access point for development. It's a marquee controller based on ARM architecture. And then we have curriculum for IoT, machine learning, motor control, control systems. And what I'm showing here at ESWE are the platforms that we use for those curricula. DigiKey has been a partner of us for the collaborations with university in a long time. All our educational content has been developed by professors for professors. Labsland will take this to a step further where we can actually allow hands-on trainings also for remote areas or students that don't have the means of purchasing the kit or having the kits themselves. We are providing a access to a real laboratory. Uh, we have some STM32 kits that the students can remotely access. All they need is a web browser, so they can write the code and they can see remotely how the equipment behaves. We have equipment right now in 14 countries uh, and the, the, the students from many other countries are accessing that equipment without having to pay the cost of buying all that equipment. I believe that our uh, tools, both software and hardware, are very accessible. So it makes it very easy for students to do hands-on training. All you need to do is to change one person. Have that one person have access to the right tools at the right time. It may inspire that person to become an electrical engineer. And the person may become an inventor and invent something great that has never been conceived before. Right now, we are on the cusp of making this available to that right person on the planet. We're joined now by Joyce Main and Holly Matasovich. Thanks so much for taking time to chat with us today. Thank you. All right, so first question, um, Joyce, we'll start with you. What's the main area of focus here for the journal? So um, I'm the co-editor in chief with David Knight for the Journal of Engineering Education. And primarily we publish research and review articles um, focusing on engineering education. I'm the editor for Advances in Engineering Education and it's a practice-based journal. Mm -hmm. So the manuscripts that we focus on have an engineering education innovation grounded in theory and prior research with a conceptual framework and a good solid evaluation. And what would you say are some of the highlights from this past year for you? So this past year, we moved to having sort of regularly quarterly issues. So January, April, July, and October. And then we've also serialized each issue and gotten DOIs on the issues. And those are important because next steps are gonna be getting our journal indexed in some of the major databases. So that's gonna be our go forward work is that indexing. Okay, Joyce, what would you say the highlights were for you this past year? One of the things that's happened for JEE is that it has moved completely online. And so we are able to publish more articles per issue. Um, along with that is um, we're really striving to increase accessibility to our journal. And so this year we were able to remove the page fees and administration fees. And so hopefully that will encourage more authors to submit to our journal. That transitions nicely into my next question. What is the review process like? In general, when authors submit an article to us, um, David Knight or I will take a look at the article to see if it's within scope. So is it within the relevant area of engineering education? And does it have a theoretical framework? And does it meet the general criteria that we've outlined for the journal? And if yes, then we move it on to an associate editor or an assistant editor who will then pick three reviewers to review the article. And we try to, um, you know, get back to authors within three to four months so that they can hear about, you know, um, the next steps for their um, particular article or manuscript. And what, what about for you? What's the review process like yes, for you? So, so our process is very similar with the exception that we assign two reviewers typically. Um, but I do want to take a minute and just talk about what the experience is like for reviewers, since the process is very similar. Um, we try to make it easy for reviewers because we know how busy everybody is and how hard it is to commit to reading one more thing and evaluating one more thing. And so 
They have the criteria, they read the article considering the criteria, answer a series of questions with ratings, and then also add some comments to enhance the review and try to give helpful and supportive feedback to make the, help the manuscript be that much stronger in the next round. Great, uh, thank you guys so much. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. We're joined now by Tricia Pendergrover, who is speaking here at the uh, convention today. So first of all, let's talk about DEI. Why is diversity, equity, and inclusion so important in engineering? You know, I think engineering is um, often forgotten as a socio-technical field. And I think that um, when we think about the ways in which engineering has sometimes made really great advances, but also sometimes have inadvertently created some um, inequities in society, um, it's really important for us to keep in mind and keep in center that it's at the heart of our discipline. It's not on the side, but it's actually at the center of who we are as engineers and the, the kinds of solutions we're trying to identify and the kinds of solutions we're trying to create. Do you feel like people on their own, you know, do they have the agency on their own to drive equitable change in this field? You can do a lot on your own, um, thinking about your own sort of knowledge base? Um, are you making sure that you're aware of some of the inequities that have existed? Um, are you really learning about best practices as it relates to teaching and learning and creating welcoming environments for students? Um, but you can also do a lot more and amplify your efforts when you're able to um, work with others. And so what can engineers do you feel like, what can they do to make sure that their teams, that they're being not just diverse, but also welcoming? A lot of times we, um, uh, create a space for people, you know, it's like there's a seat at the table, um, but then you don't let them actually fully participate at that table conversation. Since I work at a teaching and learning center, oftentimes we talk about how do you um, make sure that student teams are most effective. And so we often encourage the use of peer review and having students, you know, give each other feedback on how those interactions work. Um, in part, we do that because there's been a lot of research that shows that certain groups are marginalized in those team experiences. And so if you're able to do some peer evaluation to just kind of get a sense of, you know, just holistically, how are we functioning as a team? Do we respect everyone? Are we able to hear from all the different perspectives? Um, because that's really where the best parts of engineering come together, when you have all those diverse perspectives that are bringing forth new ideas. Now, what DI initiatives have you, you know, facilitated? What are you hoping to accomplish more of? They've ranged from um, smaller projects where I am looking within my staff and we're working together to develop our own skills. But in terms of larger scale initiatives, I've been a part of two NSF sponsored um, projects. One was called the Inclusive STEM Teaching Project. And this is a large, massive, open online course that's specifically on um, integrating inclusive teaching practices within the STEM context. More recently, though, I've been a part of a NSF funded grant um, within our college at Michigan Engineering that's focusing on teaching equity-centered engineering. We're partnering with several, again, this is this whole idea of partnering, right? Yeah. So we're partnering with folks across the college and the School of Ed, um, with our Center for Socially Engaged Design, as well as our teaching center, the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching and Engineering. Um, and we're looking at ways to develop a framework for how to actually um, create an equity-centered engineering uh, framework. And then our center is really responsible for the professional development. How do we support instructors to not only integrate those case studies in the classroom, but also create an environment where those case studies can really flourish, right? So again, coming back to that idea of what kind of a welcoming environment to, um, would best help students to learn in those environments. Okay, tie it all in together. We're bringing it back to the partnership, bringing it back to Absolutely. the beginning. All right, Trishia Pindergarver, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this episode of ASWE TV. Hopefully you've gotten a better idea of all the paths an engineer can take in their career. But if you do need a refresher, 
You can keep watching ACTV on screens around the convention center. On the AC website. In your hotel room on channel 90 at the Sheraton. And finally, on YouTube and Twitter. Tune into our final episode tomorrow to hear all about what's on the horizon for the future of engineering and engineering education. ASW CEO Jacqueline El Sayed will discuss what the next year will look like for the society. And Carl Reed and Eric Jones will share insight into how we can advance anti racism in engineering. I'm Melissa Kim, and I'll see you then.